What's the good word, Josh? Your boy DKB here. A lot of you mentioned uh, enjoying the updates for the 2024 New York Jets draft class and kind of my thoughts on uh, how they will shake out landing on the 53-man roster. And you wanted to know my thoughts on the undrafted free agent class that we brought in. Now, we had an insane amount of people that we brought in, replacements, returns, etc. So I can't dive into everyone. But for those that haven't already been cut by the time I'm doing this video and uh, for the ones that I think uh, have had their moments or lack of moments and therefore are easier decisions, I still have a pretty solid and long list here for you guys. So let's get into some weapons to kick things off. We had Brandon Smith, one of our late additions, and he ended up showing uh, out as one of the best uh, Ross, one of the best wide receivers in terms of having a third string or lower type guy, right? Finishes his preseason with five catches for 124 yards. That was about a 24 yard per reception average. And one of the things that I really think stood out the most about seeing him even in the limited action is that there was, uh, you've seen the sideline concentration grab, right? The, the 34 yard throw from Andrew Peasley versus the Giants. You've seen him become a big play security blanket for Adrian Martinez. Um, and ultimately, I think it shows well enough in his PFF grade. I'm not one that likes to stick specifically to that, but I think it is at least a decent enough barometer. So he finishes his preseason with a 75.8 PFF grade. The biggest thing that I can say about him is that ironically, he seems to at least demonstrated everything that a lot of people thought we would have got out of a guy like Isaiah Winstead uh, as a big body possession receiver that had a little bit to him in terms of uh, some burst, some athleticism that would catch some cornerbacks off guard uh, that think they just need to kind of get physical with him. And uh, he showed the ability to go out there and be able to help extend plays clicking with uh, Adrian Martinez for the most part, but obviously showing up for Andrew Peasley as well. I would honestly consider him a potential replacement for a guy like Irvin Charles if the Jets think that they have enough gunner type guys and that he hasn't shown enough as a receiver and they'd rather try to place him back on practice squad. But nonetheless, I would definitely say he's one of our top, if not the top option in terms of wide receiver weapons that should be uh, one of the first looks, right? If he gets snatched up during the waiver wire, I wouldn't be surprised either based on what he was able to do. Then we turn our attention to Isaiah Winstead, uh, the next wide receiver up. He went 0 for 4 uh, on catches, 4 targets, 0 grabs. He finishes his preseason with a 45.6 grade. And to be honest, there wasn't really any point during training camp or during these games that really stood out from a run blocking capacity um, or from a receiving capacity, right? I think one of our final practices, he finally ended up making somewhat of an impact where he got a touchdown, and I believe that was uh, via Adrian Martinez, but you can't wait until the final practice to really show something. So I was hoping he could make more of his opportunity. He was a guy that brought a little bit of curiosity to me when I did my scouting breakdown for him, but I can see why he's maybe bounced around. And uh, Isaiah Winstead was one of the guys that I mentioned Actually, I think this might have applied to Brandon Smith, too, but uh, he was supposed to go to his team as the top option. And uh, if I'm mixing up my players, forgive me, but I believe he ended up becoming the second or third guy uh, before ultimately coming over to the Jets. But nonetheless, he still doesn't seem to be NFL ready for all of the physical traits that he brings to the team. Uh, if there was going to be anybody that uh, uh, could have been able to utilize him, it would have been Adrian Martinez. And uh, we ended up rocking with Brandon Smith as his go-to guy in most cases. So um, not a guy that I'm going to say is going to make our practice squad at all. To be honest, I'd be surprised if he really gets any other looks, in, at least in the first initial run through of like waiver wires, etc. Uh, but hopefully he, he can find a way to latch on somewhere else and things start clicking for him. Left, uh, excuse me, Lincoln Sefcik, our tight end. Now, this was a guy that I talked about being extremely raw. He's really new to the tight end position in comparison to mostly anybody else in his draft class, uh, where he's really only been playing for, let's say, the last 
three or four years and uh, it showed right uh, his rawness was clearly still on display in the preseason I can't recall really many plays whatsoever I, I remember one catch specifically and it was probably like a seven yarder or something like that and it wasn't anything special I think he caught a slant and he was able to you know fumble for a few not fumble but truck his way through for a couple extra yards but ultimately Two catches, 10 yards on the season. He finishes with a 56.6 PFF grade. This is a guy, though, that I'm still intrigued to see if Ron Middleton can find a way to mold up. Now, while I want to give a guy like Zach Kuntz uh, an extra year, wait until year three to see if he's still looking like he can't do anything, Lincoln Sefchik would be, I expect him to achieve everything that Zach Kuntz really should have by now if he can sit on the practice squad and really get some NFL coaching. Recall from my scouting breakdown video for him that he didn't even really have a position coach until about two years ago and was able to ball out and show some things and not just a run blocking capacity but also showing up as a receiver when he finally actually had an offense that wanted to pass and had a quarterback that they trusted so this is a guy that I think you can't really look at anything he's necessarily done in this preseason you have to kind of get excited about the traits that he's shown uh, and hope that he finds a way to to really tap into those when he can get some solid coaching and some consistency uh, with the reps that he'll get on scout team looks right Cole Lavao our guard from the UFL they're all UFL guard he's intriguing right 168 snaps was tied for fourth most I believe amongst all guards had a top 10 grade in pass blocking from PFF and ultimately finished with a 77.7 PFF grade this is a guy that I think could be a underrated uh let me not say that what I mean to say is that if we didn't have someone like Xavier Newman on this roster, I think he could push for a backup guard spot, honestly. I still wouldn't put it out of the question that he could maybe challenge a guy like Wes Schweitzer, but I think in the, the pecking order of backup centers, they would prefer a guy like Wes Schweitzer and Xavier Newman that at least have that experience. But I'm very intrigued by what Cole Laval brought. I fully expect somebody to try to snatch him up. I don't think he'll sneak past waivers. If he does, though, he's 100% a candidate to remain with the New York Jets. I know he signed a three-year, $2.8 million contract, none of it being guaranteed. This offseason, if they can find a way to keep him on this roster, I would definitely recommend it. I think he brought some pop in the run game, but I think this unexpected uh, efficiency in the pass uh, pro level uh, is something that you can really build on. And while I won't say you can rely on any particular aspect of his game, him seeing this many snaps, I think, is a... Uh, a preview into the idea that the Jets do like what they've seen out of him. You take that in comparison to a guy like Brady Latham, our guard out of Arkansas. He only saw 65 snaps, and in those snaps, he allowed a sack, finished with a 54.8 PFF grade. To be honest, I haven't uh, been able to really see anything out of Brady Latham. Uh, I know he's been out there for some plays. I know I've seen at least two or three where there's been some run game push, but to be honest, he hasn't shown out in any significant way, right? And I know usually if you don't have much to speak about in terms of offensive line play, that's normally a good thing, meaning you haven't stood out in some kind of negative facet. Uh, but when it comes to a lot of these offensive line guys outside of the exceptions like a Cole Lavallo, there's not a ton that I've been able to glimpse into. Uh, and that's just because I haven't been able to really dive into a ton of all 22 tape. I'm pretty much relying on all highlights and a couple standout plays that may have uh, you know struck my fancy right but nonetheless uh, Brady Latham is still a guy that brought um, again a, a lot of traits that you can like as a guy that came undrafted to us um, the Jets need and honestly this is just a blanket statement as a whole they need to stockpile as much offensive line talent as they can in the the practice squad uh, pipeline for development um, and then whatever they can stash on the, the active roster, right? Whether they're suiting up for game days or not, which is why I would push for a guy like Cole Lavallo to find a way to make the roster, right? Let's get into some of the fun stuff, though. Let's talk quarterbacks. Andrew Peasley. Now, he won the rookie minicamp competition uh, a while back, and he's been on the roster since. Finishes his preseason with 20, going 20 of 33, uh, which was good for a 60.6 .6 completion percentage. 
181 yards and a touchdown. Now, uh, on paper, that looks solid enough for a guy that hasn't been drafted. Um, but keep in mind, he's been playing essentially as a third string guy the entire time. Never really found a way to earn any kind of uh, significant reps in terms of like second string or anything along those lines. And I can make an argument that AJ Martinez came in and pushed him almost immediately. But one of the things that really stood out to me is that he... I called out the fact that if he's going to succeed in the NFL, it's essentially going to be as a field general, field manager. <laughs> Let's not say field general, but in this case, he's shown to be a low level one, right? Just when you're comparing with the competition he's facing, a lot of third, fourth string type guys, a lot of guys that aren't going to see any kind of practice squad. And what really stuck out stood out to me was a lot of the bad ball placement. There were a ton of balls where guys were having to reach down to their ankles, to their kneecaps to try to snag something. And the play was essentially done before it ever really had a chance to go. And a lot of those throws were near-ish the line of scrimmage or behind, which makes it even worse because there were ample opportunities for not a humongous play, but at least this guy to get an easy three, four yards, and then maybe more if he makes something happen. Uh, but he ended up killing a lot of those plays before they ever started. So. I don't see the Jets, especially in comparison to Adrian Martinez, who we'll chat about here in a minute, expecting to pursue him. If he sticks around somehow, I'm going to assume it's from a comfortability standpoint, and maybe they think they can work out some of those kinks from him. Uh, but I am fully diving into Adrian Martinez, who we're going to chat about here now, right? 25 of 47, a 53.2 completion percentage, which I don't love. 270 yards, no touchdowns, and an interception. Tack on, and I, I, you know, ESPN didn't show it. I was too lazy to look it up. But however many rushing yards he was also able to pick up, uh, which the dual threat ability really stood out, right? One of the things that I really loved is he found himself a guy, Brandon Smith. Not only that, though, you've seen his ability to force the defense in situations they wanted, they didn't want to be in in third down. And a lot of those third downs were in situations where Izzy couldn't pick up um, – <clears throat> enough decent yardage in first and second downs and so you're talking about third and sixes thirds and eights uh and adrian martinez was go was able to go out there and convert a lot of those situations some on the ground some via him maneuvering around and being able to find the open man or at least give his open man a big opportunity and while he still probably wouldn't have packed on a touchdown there's a, he should have racked up at least probably another 50 to 70 yards between two misses from Isaiah Winstead, I believe it was. No, Lance McCutcheon. Um, and then there was another big one that uh, Zach Kuntz missed, which was right through his hand. So, and that one actually probably could have went for a touchdown. So I take the previous statement back. But nonetheless, I think Adrian Martinez, when you look at how the offense functioned with him versus with Andrew Peasley, it seemed like we were more so able to take advantage of field position, more so able to march down the field and uh, really challenge a lot of these cornerbacks uh, in situations that they didn't want to be put in having to run longer not having to get coverage sacks etc and also him just being able to maneuver and evade a lot of that pressure so I love what he brought uh again I don't know what will pan out with Jordan Travis but this is a guy that I would definitely stick on to the roster as an emergency quarterback um and, and he'll give you a ton of tremendous looks in terms of scout team reps now let's talk about some of the defensive guys Eric Watts he finishes and I should have made this disclaimer at the top. ESPN did a horrible job tracking a lot of their stats, so uh, some of these may be off by a bit. But Eric Watts, he finishes with four tackles, half a sack, a pass deflection of 58.7 PFF grade. And one of the things that stood out is that he still was able to go out there and pressure the QB. And that's the name of the game when it comes to this Jets D-line. I did see that he placed pretty poorly in terms of run defense grades. And that was a lot of the same token uh, weaknesses that will get called out from a scouting breakdown is that he hasn't been overly good setting the edge. He can kind of get washed out of some plays. Um, he'll get, you know, mixed up sometimes by some guys that have no business really winning against him maybe one or two times out of ten um and i think you've seen all of that on display but nonetheless there's definitely been improvements since college 
to just these couple months with being with the Jets, being in this defensive room. We've heard of it, and you know, the team talk about the standard that everybody's living up to. This is an impressive guy. I wouldn't want any of these undrafted free agents really on the defensive side that have obviously balled out uh, to get exposed to waiver wires because I think we're missing out on some promising talent specific to us, right? I think our scheme and the talent we've been able to acquire uh, allows some of these guys to flourish or at least uh, show flashes more consistently than you would generally expect from guys, uh, you know, just coming into their rookie year. Leonard Taylor, the third, our DT, <laughs> probably the best guy, right? I know I've seen an article and I, I'm not sure if I'm going to drop a video on it yet, but Boiling it down to the mere, to pure basics was he led uh, our he led the DT position as a whole in preseason uh, in terms of pressure rate. He also was able to go out there and I believe finish first in sacks if ESPN was accurate. Eight tackles, four sacks, which would have put him first. He had a run stuff, good for a sixty two point nine PFF grade. Now when I look at the comparison, right. You think about Eric Watts versus a guy like Leonard Taylor. Leonard Taylor should easily win. A guy that had first round expectations. A lot of it was surrendered, surrounded by work ethic, motor issues, uh, or concerns. I don't think you've seen that level the same thing, right? At, at least not by the time preseason games really kicked around. Sala talked about the fact that he really seemed to heighten his level uh, of focus and dedication in the last month or so. Uh, and I think that definitely reflects here. But one of the things that I definitely saw is that he is 100% pass rush focused, right? There were plenty of times where it looked like, and we're not a two-gap scheme by any means, uh, but it looked like he was always looking to attack the A-gap, shoot between that center and guard, and uh, he ended up being flushed out of some lanes that would have easily stopped some runs that didn't go for huge gains, but you could have turned something into a uh, additional run stuff if he was a little bit more focused on uh, just getting into the backfield first as to as opposed to purely tackling the QB. And this does kind of fall in line with the thought process that uh, Sala initially put out there, find the run on the way to the QB. Um, but it's something he should learn uh, to be able to adapt to, right? There's, there's a reason why we hold Quinn into such a high regard is that he's still elite versus the, the pass, but he also knows how to affect the run essentially every down that he's out there, which is why we see our defense look completely different when he's in versus when he's out but i really like the look of leonard taylor and uh if we'll never get tanzel smart a chance it only makes sense to sneak leonard taylor onto the roster with Braden mcgregor he finishes with six tackles three sacks which i believe is tied for third and a 67.7 pff grade and this was a guy that from all accounts he should have walked in and been a well-rounded player right Really, the biggest concerns were the health of the leg, uh, injury, along with a multitude of other things that he's dealt with over the course of his career, significant leg injuries. I believe it's two or three ACL problems at this point, uh, let alone a few other issues. But he came in with a, a repertoire of moves, right? Um, and I think it reflected, it, obviously, he had the huge final game there against the Giants, but it felt like every single game you were seeing him strike some kind of fear into the quarterback. He was always active and around the, the line of scrimmage, especially in the run game as well, which is really appreciated. So he looks like a diamond in the rough. I won't lie. He's a guy that should be able to contribute right away and as he continues to get healthy you ideally over the course of the the season i can see him really turning himself um i don't know if we've necessarily had another player like him on the edge that's been uh great against the run um and also has been good uh in the the, the pass rush game right i don't want to necessarily give him jermaine johnson comparisons because he's not elite in any element uh but maybe he could be a jermaine johnson light type of player um, and obviously coming from Michigan he's going to be everything the Jets want from a mental uh, uh, personality standpoint when it comes to that motor and really embracing the gas uh, all gas no bricks moniker right Brandon Codrington um, our slot backup slot cornerback at this point seven tackles a pass deflection Six targets, four catches allowed, a 63.1 PFF grade, and he led the league in return <clears throat> yeah, in terms of being a returner. 
um, grade wise. I don't know if he did it on a yard spaces or anything like that, but obviously you've seen how he was able to impact things in the return and kick game. One of the things I'll say is it had it's been more elusiveness with him, right? It hasn't necessarily been for um, you can't think about it in the same way that you've seen great returners like Devin Hester or like even our own Leon Washingtons at McKnight's of the world. He's seen where the holes are, but when he's been cornered and he needs to try to make just something positive happen, he's very slippery. He's been able to use his uh, minuscule size to actually find a way to get out of the grasp of a lot of guys that just kind of want to barrel over him. Um, and, and you've seen him turn those into huge plays, right? Quick starter steps, able to kind of tap into that acceleration really, really quick. So the only question mark around him is that as a returner, I feel like he should definitely make the team. Regardless of how he's getting it done, he's getting it done with big plays, uh, setting us up close to the 40 or the 50. It feels like almost every time he touches the ball. Can we really rely on him as a cornerback, right? At, at this point, I don't think you want to have another... Um, Justin Hardy type player on the team and that's my fear with guys like Irvin Charles right now or even a Brandon Codrington uh, is that that will end up being the case um, but uh, I mean it is what it is right right now it's a worthwhile skill set for uh, a phase of football that's going to return to glory right 80 to 100 touches what we're expecting 80 to 100 touches in Brandon Codrington's hands right now feels dangerous and the plus side of that as well is that even if he can't get the ball let's say 40 something times a season that means he's forcing teams to kick it out of the back of the the the, the, the in the back of the touchdown zone and so i believe we're starting things off at the the 30 or the 35 something like that if that ends up being the case jackson sermon the linebacker he finishes with seven tackles, a pass deflection, a 64.2 PFF grade. I can't really say a ton about him because nothing stood out, but that's kind of his memo. He's a very fundamentally sound guy, a coach's kid, so you know that he's going to pick up on what the coaching staff wants to do very, very well. He just kind of seems like he would be built for this staff. Not a guy that's overly athletic, but kind of a throwback linebacker that just knows how to take care of business. Um, but I would imagine he can kind of fall into that Tanzo smart role where he's good for teaching moments. Uh, with, uh, sadly, when it comes to probably developing other guys on the offense or just teaching technique and kind of play recognition and stuff to other linebackers. Uh, but this is a guy that I can see people slowly falling in love with just because he's He's, he's generally sound, right? Um, and if he gets beat, it's generally not going to be um, for lack of experience or lack of you know understanding of the play and what the offense wanted to do. Taking a look at some of our last players here, Shamar Bartholomew. Eight tackles, two pass deflections, two catches on nine targets, and 87-point PFF grade, which I believe is one of the top numbers uh, for cornerbacks, just falling below JBC, by the way. And uh, this was a guy that I highlighted that I thought could ball out. He did it in a different manner, though. I thought he would be uh, much more of a playmaker, and we've seen it pop up during training camp. Hasn't necessarily went his way during uh, these preseason games. But he was a guy that teams wanted to challenge, obviously, and they had very little success in doing so. A lot of that is, again, the quality of the quarterbacks that are coming out there. But um, he has a fluidness to him that I really, really like. I think there's still a lot of technical components that he needs to uh, uh, work out, right? I talked before about uh, those plays where the cornerback hasn't necessarily done anything great to impact uh, the pass or, or the success or failure of a particular pass play, but they're still celebrating. That's not quite Shamar Bartholomew's boat, uh, but there is something to build on. There's something to work with here, um, and I think it's really just a matter of experience with him. He's another guy that kind of feels like a hidden gem, uh, and I'm excited for his future, to be honest. I think he could sneak onto the practice squad. That's what I fully expect right now, but uh, he seems like he could take developmental jumps as a guy that's had to get it out the mud in terms of any uh, um, finding reasons to force the coaching staff to get him on the field, and I like that quality in the player. Trey Swilling, as we wrap up here, three tackles, a forced fumble, pass deflection, one catch on five targets, a 69.7 PFF grade. Very minimal I can tell you about him. I didn't get a chance to really 
take a bunch of looks at Trace Willing, but I know there were two hits specifically where I said he's packing a punch, and he was able to go out there and uh, make some guys second guess trying to uh, high point a ball in his direction, and I think that's the most that you can uh, really expect in that safety room right now where there's a lot of athleticism, uh, at least when you look at a guy like Tony Adams, a guy like Ashton Davis, um, and, and Really, nobody stood out in a significant way, right? I still look at the safety group as one of the biggest weaknesses, but I think almost everybody you look at in that safety room has found a way to have their moments, whether it's been training camp, whether it's been the games, and so at least you can say you have something to look forward to with a lot of these guys. And our final player here, Jarius Monroe, he was another guy that I thought uh, I could be really high on by the time that preseason ended. 16 tackles, got himself a run stuff. He did allow five catches on five targets, but he finishes with a 73.9 PFF grade. More technically sound in the run game uh, and, and keeping the catches he did allow to a minimum than anything else, which I think is probably why his PFF grade is a lot higher than I would expect. Uh, but Jarius Monroe, again, toolsy, another guy that's had to uh, struggle to get playing time in college, but once he did, his coaching staff ended up trusting him with quite a bit. Jarius Monroe is very, um, I don't want to say efficient. Well, what's the, he kind of has that Jamie and Sherwood like mold, in my opinion, where he's, uh, he's very mentally intelligent and he can find a way to go out there and apply that onto the field. Um, there's always probably going to be some hitches in this game. Very few safeties are, you know, perfect uh you know if any at all right but what i'm generally trying to get at is that i think there are many things that he could excel at if he really finds a way to to lock in with marquan manuel here uh utilize as many of these practice reps as he can get he's a guy that i can find uh fighting for a competition uh fighting for a spot in a competition next year as well right not just between him versus Trey Swilling but uh you take a look at probably having to revamp that entire safety room again minus a guy like Tony Adams uh and these guys look like they could fall into place right once again the Jets may not be investing any kind of significant resource in that safety room and they'll opt for the guys that they've had a chance to stick with them for a year and really look for uh how they really look for um uh taking their game to the next level after having a, a fundamental understanding of this playbook and being able to just go out there and play freely with the traits that they have and uh let me know what you guys think right ultimately this is just some of my observations it's very high level you guys know for those that are following me for now uh i'm super busy with the kids pretty often um and so it doesn't allow a ton of time to you know dive into tape and different things of that nature but I think these are pretty solid takeaways, but let me know what you guys think as well as any undrafted free agents that I'm clearly missing here. And I'll catch you guys again. Peace.